When we live in the world, we're sharing a becoming with other beings. And you know how beings are defined. They're defined by their attachments. And they have to feed. This applies to other beings, this applies to us, as long as we take on the identity of a being. Which means that there are going to be conflicts. And there are a lot of conflicts that the more you get involved with them, the more they entrench you in this level of becoming. And the Buddha saw that the way out was, in many cases, not to get involved with the conflicts. He taught what he called the middle way. We know the most famous formulation of that in his first sermon. We found the middle way between commitment to sensual pleasure and commitment to self-torture. And he said that neither commitment was noble. And he proposed the Eightfold Path as the middle way out. Now, this is not a middling way, halfway between self-torture and halfway between sensual indulgence. It cut through. You might think of the number field, if you ever took math. You know the number field is defined by two coordinates. There's the x-coordinate going left and right, and the y-coordinate going up and down. And the two coordinates meet at their zero points. And you might think of the question of sensual indulgence versus self-torture as being on the left to right coordinate. And the Buddha was coming in from the up and down, looking at things in a totally different way, framing his questions in different ways. We see this, however, not only in that sermon, but in many other talks where he points out two, two extremes. There's the extreme that everything is a multiplicity or everything is a oneness. He says the middle way out of that is dependent co-rising. There are two extremes of saying that the person who does the action is the one who's going to receive the results, and the person who does the action is going to be somebody else who receives the results. He says the middle way out of that is to see that the fact that either view is a result of contact. This gives you an idea of what he's doing when he goes to the up and down coordinate. Instead of looking at the content of either extreme, he asks, well, how are these extremes formulated? How do they come about? How do you look at the process so that you don't get sucked into that either or? In another place he calls this seeing what has become as what has become. In other words, seeing things as processes. Views not so much in terms of their content, but in terms of how they're formed and how they're clung to. And how you can develop this passion for the process by which they're formed or clung to. And it's the same process for either side. So rather than getting involved in which side is right and which side is wrong, he's basically saying the whole controversy is built out of clinging and there's going to be suffering. So it's good to look at the various issues that you face as you go through the day and how many of them are issues where you really do have to get involved. And how many, many of them are issues that are forced on you or the mind forces on you. You should ask yourself, well, what's going on here? What's the process by which this either or was formed? And how do we cut it through? You have to be selective in how you do this, because there are controversies where you do have to get involved, where you do have responsibilities. Buddha himself, when he set out the Vinaya, said there are dispute issues and there are accusation issues, there are disputes over what's right, what's wrong, what's dharma, what's not dharma, what's Vinaya, what's not Vinaya. Accusation issues. Did so-and-so break one of the principles? And if so, or if not, how do you find out? And the Buddha sets out the processes by which you should settle these issues. You don't say, well, 
it's a matter of right and wrong, I'm above right and wrong, and I'll just go home. That's irresponsible. When an issue comes up as to what really is Dharma, what's not, what's Vinaya, what's not, the monks especially have to be responsible for looking into it. When someone's been accused of breaking one of the principles, we have to look into it. And you look at the Buddha. It wasn't the case that he avoided every debate. There were cases when people would come looking for trouble. There was the Brahmin who came and said, well, so this teaching of yours, what do you teach? And the Buddha could tell he was looking for, looking for a fight. And the Buddha said, basically, the sort of doctrine whereby people don't get involved in useless debates. The Brahmin left. And there are other cases like that, people coming to see the Buddha just for the sake of money to contradict whatever he said. And he had them look at their motivation. In some cases, they were blind and they were not going to look at their motivation, in which case he had nothing to do with them. In other cases, he was able to get them to do some introspection, to see where does this conflict come from, where does this desire for conflict come from. And is it leading to a good place? Those are the best cases. But then there were others where he simply engaged in the debate and established what was right and what was wrong. Which means that you have to look at the question of controversies and show some discernment. Which ones do you get involved with to figure out who's right and who's wrong? And which ones do you try to cut through? This applies not only to controversies outside, but controversies inside your own mind. Sometimes there are issues where you, your mind is driving itself crazy. Then you have to step back and ask yourself, What gets resolved? What's accomplished by answering this question? Now, where does this question come from? What kind of motivation? What kind of belief? You're going to chase things down, dependent core arising. What kind of fabrication went into this? What kind of name and form? In other words, your intentions, what things you're paying attention to. What are you clinging to? What are you craving? That puts things on the up and down coordinate. And you find you can release yourself from a lot of issues. Because one of the things that defines this world, this state of becoming in which we live, is the issues. And a lot of them, that the more you get entangled in them, the more you just lead to further and further becoming. Because after all, we're here to get beyond further becoming. So you have to figure out which ones are the ones that are purely entangling, which are the ones where we are responsible. The Buddha himself, after his awakening, had to settle a lot of issues. But he was able to do it in such a way that he wasn't entangled in the becoming. That's a skill. And his example is a challenge. If he avoided all issues, that would be easy. Just avoid issues. But that's not the example he set. You have to figure out which issues are worthwhile, which ones are not. how to deal responsibly with the worthwhile issues, and how to take that middle-way approach to the ones that are not cut right through the middle. That way you can live in the world and be responsible.
but minimize entanglement. They say that the Buddha had an all-around eye. He looked at issues from all around. And a good part of our practice is learning how to look at our own issues in the same way, all around. Not just left or right, but think about up or down. And then make the best decision that you can come to based on looking at things from an all-around way. <laughs>